everybody, this is Dan. Today we watched the 2017 film Man Life, which is about a guy named Merle who's pretty close to the last remaining member of a political and religious group from the mostly from the 1930s, although they had an extended existence as the uh, the film goes into well into the uh, the early 1980s. Well, I, I mean, I guess up up to uh, a couple of years ago because that's uh, that's when the the movie was being shot. But yeah, so we we follow around Merle as he uh, kind of lives out the last days of Lawsonomy the teachings of a professional baseball player from the turn of the century named Alfred Lawson. Uh, we managed to get, uh, because I know a guy who knows a guy, uh, we managed to get the director, Ryan Sarnowski, on the show with us. And so this episode, uh, the episode you're about to hear, uh, we've got him in the studio. And, well, not, I mean, nobody's in the studio because there's a pandemic, but uh, we're, we're all in our you know, couches, laundry rooms, having a conversation. So enjoy. All right, cool. So, hey, everybody, this is Dan. And this is Ron. And uh, this is, uh, we, we have a we have a third person today. Uh, All right, you want me to introduce myself? Is that yeah, it? Yeah, 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 yeah. That, that, that's what, yeah. Sorry, I didn't pick up on that cue. Oh, it's, it's oh. all good. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm Ryan uh, Sarnowski, uh, director of Man Life. Mm, yeah, cool. And uh, so that's, uh, that kind of is a, a great setup for the movie we watched for today's episode, which is coincidentally Man Life. Uh, we just happened to have Ryan calling in for the uh, the show and coincidentally decided to watch that movie both at the same time without uh, conferencing about it at all. Yeah, yeah. D yeah. Dan and I didn't even coordinate. I just, you know, hey, this looked interesting. Let me watch this. I'm like, whoa. So, um, well, welcome, Ryan. It's 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 very <laughs> exciting to have you here. Well, I'm, I'm glad to be here. You know, it's nice meeting new people and considering we can't get out. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cool. Oh, yeah. This is like a, an extra remote episode because there it's like remote in three directions. Right, right. I, I, had you guys been recording in person together before this? Yeah, yeah. He lives like uh, well, you're, you're like a twenty minute drive away from me. Yeah, something like that. Depending. Yeah. On time. So usually Ron comes over and uh, we watch on uh, in the living room here. And uh, then we just kind of set up the laptop and record for an hour, however long. An hour? <laughs> well, okay, an hour and change. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes very long. Um, I mean, what's the longest we ever recorded for? I, uh, I know we did one that was at least two hours. Okay. And it, it, it came out to be after removing, after truncating silence, it, it that took 20 minutes off. And then after removing a little bit of stuff that was tangents of tangents of tangents of tangents, that mm -hmm. was probably another 10 minutes. Oh, yeah, Ryan. So, so even though we're talking about a movie, and then, you know, and in this case, your movie, uh, we tend to sometimes go off on you know <laughs> tangents and uh that's part of it so. that's okay i'm used to that too that's sort of how my brain works just a series of endless rabbit holes to go down oh okay great then we're all in uh this is uh this is the perfect combination here um yeah cool so uh so the movie came out in 2017 and you were you were working on it for a while right like a couple of years there a couple uh you know close to eight eight, eight? Years okay eight since wow yeah it's, it's a little hazy now i know the the first shot we ever took with our camera was me holding my son who was just newborn at the time in my arm like this and uh you know he was probably eight by the time we put it out i think so yeah mm. oh wow quite a while that's impressive <laughs> well for what it's worth there isn't a sense so much of like um I the movie is really kind of it feels really fresh and really um what's the nice is light an okay word if front fresh and light like like like, like light like a souffle like it like it kind of it it, it settles nicely in the palate mm -hmm. well, that's that's what we were going for souffle <laughs> yeah, that was uh no i mean i'm glad that it's, it's not linked to one specific moment in time um mm -hmm. or a certain thing i mean there's certainly t a timeliness to the subject matter at times and continues to be and i think there's perhaps a bit of a 
clock or a time in the, our, our own subject and kind of hero of our movie, you know, and his, the clock ticking against him. But I mean, I also, you know, I worry sometimes with documentaries that they're too much, almost like a, a news story. It's just of a moment and it's gone and it's replaced. It's, it's so replaceable nowadays, documentaries that, that, you know, it either has to strike right at that moment, capture it, or it's too late. Mm, right. Yeah, this definitely felt different from like the average documentary um, that I've seen because I don't know was there even one point in which there was in which we could hear you asking questions I don't remember oh yeah I, I could I think I, I heard you like two or three times in the background but there's two distinct moments uh the very beginning of the film I, I ask our subject Marilla question uh -huh. and then um about once or twice maybe after that midway through the film there's other instances uh I'm not a big fan of hearing my movie um you know <laughs> I've taught documentary for a while so I know the idea of you know using cinema verite techniques and engaging with the subject and they're cool I'm fine with them it's just it wasn't my thing we set out to make this movie but also you know I think you got to change sometimes with what what the cards you've been dealt are in a movie and our, our subject sometimes was not easy to work with when it came to getting the answers to the questions we wanted so mm -hmm. we often ask the same questions over and over <laughs> hoping that we kind of chisel away at his armor because he had a lot of armor on about not wanting to be seen as a fool or be taken uh, for granted or made fun of or even paranoid that we were part of the this grander conspiracy meant to keep lawsonomy out of the history books and that you know, he had a lot of issues with that and that's probably another reason why it took so many years for us to finish the movie was we just had to get him to buy into the fact that we were allies and not trying to just take piss out of him for comedic purposes <laughs> yeah so, it, oh, sorry, so like how much of the uh the production process was like getting merle to let you film him and then like how long were you actually filming him uh we filmed him for quite a while um the bulk of the filming came in 2009 to 2011 was the bulk of it um a lot of the air show stuff a lot of merle and his um uh girl Girlfriend, new wife, rekindled love. Betty was was early on because she passed away pretty early. Mm -hmm. um, so we got a lot of sit down interviews, a lot of talk with Merle uh, earlier on, and then some more of the human side of him was what we were filming in the later years, like him in in the nursing home playing music, him uh, kind of being more contemplative or opening up about stuff. Mm -hmm. um, it was hard at the beginning, especially filming other people. Like he would did not want us to film Betty. He he thought the story with he what he wanted was us to set up a camera and him to recite all of Lawson's teachings for posterity <laughs> because uh, he felt that was the only way you could really understand. Like, like Marshall um, Applewhite style? Yeah, I think. Something like, like, like that. Like just a head, like like shaky camera, and just like an overexposed head, just like reading. I, I don't know what his digital Apple idea was something. for it, but he really believed, like he was taught by Alfred Lawson, that you know the only way to understand this is to spend 30 years reading and memorizing it, and that's what he wanted to get on, as he always called it, you know, get on the disc. Get on the disc. Mm. I, we weren't shooting on it desk but we're gonna get it on the desk and um it took us a long time to convince him that people don't want to be lectured to for that long and that they had to buy into the human side of moral if they were going to believe any of the stuff he was trying to get them to read or listen to mm -hmm. um and there was a scary instance you know where we we had to sit down one day and actually show him a rough cut of the film and we thought we've seen him cut other people out completely because he felt that the message wasn't right or we didn't stick true to, to lawson's principles and so you know once we got past that rough cut things were a little easier because he had other kind of friends and stuff some who we see in the film who convinced him that we were we were being genuine and true to him and his message and we weren't making fun of it right right yeah i don't know that i would have i don't know that i would have learned as much about uh lasonomy uh or been open to it if if he was just reciting what he was saying um getting the history getting the context and getting some of that you know because we definitely got that especially even just in the headline stuff um i feel like i feel like i know more about it because it it wasn't just lecturing. I yeah, think I think, oh, sorry, Daniel. Oh, I, I think if he'd survived another couple of years, though, he could have had, like, like I, I don't know what you've been doing a lot of during this this kind of quarantine-cation, whatever <laughs> it is. 
um, but I, I've been watching like a lot of like low production value cooking value uh, cooking videos on YouTube, and I can totally imagine like him having like a very simple vlog setup, just like reading this stuff, like uh, you know if he'd survived longer. Mm-hmm. Oh, I think um, he would enjoy it. I don't know like what he would get, you know, listener or um, but with people being locked down and that maybe there isn't it, there would have been an audience for that you know um i'm sure we would have had to help him with some of the tech but he was pretty savvy for his someone his age i mean he could send emails he could send texts you know things i'm struggling with my own parents to do and they're 20 years younger than we're all us so. mm. Yeah, at one point, at one point, we even see him in front of the computer, and 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 the camera focuses on him typing. And I was like, "How, how old was he? 90? Oh, when we started filming, he was eighty nine, um, just turning ninety that year. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I mean, like I said, most of the time you see him in the movie, he's between ninety and ninety five in the movie. Mm-hmm. So, um, some of the very late stuff, I think, he's ninety five. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, you know, he, he like I said, you know, he had his troubles like we all do with technology, but right. he wasn't afraid of it. Yeah. yeah and I, I, Oh, sorry. Uh, I mean, he, he was like, if we learned any lesson from the last four years, he was only about $10 million in one bot farm away from Lossonomy, like taking over most of Europe and uh, <laughs> the United States. So I think he was on to something. He could have had... Yeah. <laughs> If it was today, he would have the Lasonomy podcast. Every week, he would read or recite some of his stuff. He could read the whole, you know, the book or the pamphlet or a whole series and just the different stuff. Yeah, I could see that. He, I, he probably could. You know, I've seen other smaller religions that, that are doing that, you know. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, just kind of missed that window, you know? Mm-hmm. Though again, he might actually be, ag- I don't know, this weird, like he might be against it too in some ways because, um, you know, Lawson himself said he didn't get into radio and he didn't get into the, the early days of that because he thought it was controlled by the financiers, as he always said. And, you know, you couldn't, I mean, Merle used the internet, but like I could definitely see him having some argument that his, you know, vlog or his podcast getting shut down would be, you know, like the financiers taking over or something like that. You know, and it wouldn't get shut down for any bad reasons. I mean, he just did something wrong, or maybe it just does. He doesn't know how to upload it. He, he'd consider that a conspiracy that the financiers were preventing the message from getting out to the public. Mm, mm, mm. So, so he know, never yeah. he never provided like a particularly concrete definition of financiers, or is that like a thing that's laid out in some kind of? Well, I, I think it's interesting that like Lawson used the term financiers to define kind of like the top tier, you know, the people who are just controlling the money you know he had these weird breakdowns about like you know sort of like the capitalists and then the you know workers and but then there was also like the financiers who were just pulling the money I forget that's how he laid it out that in his earliest days he used terms more like alien financier which kind of is that skirting of anti-semitic dialogue you know in there that these foreign influences are there he never labels them ever specifically that we kind of talk about that for a moment in the film because you know father coglin was going on at the same time in detroit where lawson was set up and he didn't like Coughlin. Now, it could have been a jealousy thing that Coughlin had more control over the radio. And so he felt like, but instead of even trying to compete, he'll just throw up his hands and say, I'm not going to compete because I can't compete because mm-hmm. it's the financiers preventing me from competing. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also think Lawson was just sometimes a bit savvier because he never used specific enough of a term when he identified these enemies. He just called them, you know, financiers. And he didn't go that one next step further and say, you know, Jewish because mm-hmm. he knew i mean you know merle told us there were many people who were jewish that were in different chapters of this direct credit um, economic organization so i think for lawson it was like how can i still just pull in the biggest number of people right, I mean, right. that was maybe one tactic he used yeah did he did he ever use the term international bankers i don't know if he ever uses that specifically bankers i don't hear too many times i mean banks get mentioned I think he always just preferred to use financier, but it did, like I said, alien financier is clearly a, you know, reference to outside influence, which usually right. tends to also lean towards, you know, international Desert people influence on America, <laughs> which is why he was like the idea that they don't win up international influence on America. You know, the same people that are like, don't get involved with the UN or mm. that mm. sort of strand of paranoia. Yeah, yeah. Do, you, do you think, to, uh, you know, maybe I didn't quite pick up on it as much. I mean, do you, 
you, do you think he was uh, more of an isolationist? Um, yes and no. I mean, a lot of his earlier stuff ties into other, I think, trends at that point in history about isolationism. I mean, there's a lot of his early writing before he even got into Lausanne or direct credits that ties into the idea of America and its military influence overseas and whether or not we're overextending ourselves in a way with that. But at the same time, he was also pro-military. He tried to get the earliest, I mean, one of his earliest planes was for the military before he went into passenger travel with airliners. Um, you know, he tried to say that he invented the aircraft carrier because he had this kind of sci-fi version of a floating vessels. It was actually like a bridge of floating vessels. Like they hop from one aircraft carrier to the other to get planes overseas. So, mm-hmm. you know, he definitely saw some financial reason for Americans' intervention overseas. But at the same time, I think he was always an America first guy, you know, or, mm-hmm. even though he came from England. So, you know, but <laughs> originally, but I think he also just picked up on what was selling at the time. So do you think, was it, do you see this more as a movie about Lawson and Lasonomy or about Merle and, uh, and actually Merle and Betty, right? That was, yes. yeah. Or, or just a combination of the two. I, don't know. I think we settled on a combination of the two. You know, I, we knew that a, a more historical documentary just about Alfred Lawson was doable. We could, we could do that. But I think we all as, as filmmakers on the crew were really just intrigued by Merle. I mean, yeah, I think yeah. his dedication for so many years uh, to this cause that what everybody else who saw Merle could tell was kind of a lost cause and you know um, Mm -hmm. that just resonated as kind of I think just humans we we felt like oh I you know we can see aspects of ourselves in Merle we can see things about ourselves that we don't like in Merle we can see things that we we kind of wish we had I mean I can't think of anything I'm dedicated to for as long as he I haven't been alive as long as he has but you know I feel like my fancies change a lot more than his have yeah I'm usually dedicated to something for a year before I move on to something totally unrelated I yeah I think we're all like that nowadays i don't know if it's like the whole you know mtv culture adhd brain thing or whatever but um well i think in terms of like people who have that kind of dedication to something like like in a weird way he kind of reminded me of, of paul mcclaud the the guy who ran the Mem- uh, the graceland 2 museum at, in holly springs outside of memphis i have I, not been there but i've heard of it i think i have an affinity for all sorts of um eccentrics Mm. Uh, passion eccentrics I mean you know the but he seems so much more functional than like Paul McClock because like I met I, I went over there about two weeks before he died and you know his like he was on his second set of teeth and he's waving this like hot pink handgun around everywhere. He hasn't <laughs> slept for, cause like the policy at that place was, uh, it was open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So if you, um, like it was literally a sign that just said like, if I don't answer, knock harder. Um, and like, it, it, you know, he lost his like wife and kids and everything cause they ran off cause they were like, we can't live Elvis 24 hours a day. And, and like a, a lot of cases like that, especially with cults, you know, it tends to implode or hit this like dramatic impasse and I I thought that was kind of interesting with Lawsonomy like there's this there's this controversy at the end of it but there's no like it, it all plays out in this very low-key manner and then Merle just sort of keeps existing in this this low-key manner without ever completely falling over the edge. Yeah, it did, I mean, we don't get the, you know, uh, Heaven's Gate type of ending, you know, mm. to this. It's not <laughs> like, oh, the cult ends with a mass suicide or, a, you know, some sort of intervention. You know, yeah, or it, it's a rather undramatic end to a cult. And I guess from a dramatist point of view, I wish, you know, I, I maybe I should have wished for something more like oh god what was the one documentary that came out not too long after ours that had that uh i'm thinking the original title was um fear is the master was the first documentary i remember about this cult up in uh the north pacific northwest anyways there was one up there that was hit on netflix you know because it did involve you know violence and explosions interruptions and, and drugs and sex and and ours i was never really had drug sex and uh death so, you know, I don't know, maybe, maybe we should have aimed for a crazier cult, but even then they don't really, they don't really hit that cult on that level status. They more feel like, you know, we're in the Scientology business of a cult, you know, like it's not, I mean, it wasn't really much about trans, I don't know, they really, you know, they weren't out there thoughts. It was more of getting people to buy in like an Amway type thing, you know, and that's yeah. kind of how it was. I mean, Lawson, I, from what we could gather after when we went actually through a bunch of like, you know, found a bunch of old records and stuff like this from Merle's from the financial side. You know, and Merle told us this a little was, you know, 
was a member, you bought the books. So like, you know, your idea. So it was like Scientology, where like they they rope you in, and then they keep getting money out of you by like charging you three times as much as a hardcover book's supposed to be. Well, it's more like of like, or, like it's it's really more of like the essential oil game or the mm. maybe Amway game or something like that, where you like you buy a case of books, and I don't I don't remember if I can even if I ever saw a number added to it, but like you know, the books cost ten books fifty dollars, mm. right? But the the listed price of the book is ten dollars, so you go sell it to all the other people for 10 and then if you if you sell it you'll make your money back but if you don't you're stuck with all your books right. oh yeah. okay yeah so it's like one of those things where you're selling like knife blocks to people door yeah. to door like yeah okay yeah and i you know i think that's a lot how it ran from the different records you know like they would write back to the main offices in detroit and say like please send me another case of books you'll find a check and club mm. you know that's the type of financial records we have and merle did say that to us now merle was a little bit of an exception because the dude never had a real job his entire life i mean he worked for the U.S. military when he served overseas and he lived off of a small bit from that and the access to the VA. Mm. But he got paid by the organization and just lived off of the like whatever land he was living on, whether it was at the original university or it was out at the farm here in Wisconsin. And he lived off the charity of others and the dude was just super resourceful. I mean, that's what also drew us to him was, you know, like he would put together that booth at the air show and it would tell us about these parts. It's like, oh yeah, this is a 1950s candy counter, some candy store was going out of business and I heard about it and I went over there and I got the candy counter. And like the backboard is all like boards I found in an alley somewhere and we took them home and we painted them up and then you know I got this piping from here and there you know like wow. he just really was able to make everything stretch and I think that's probably being partly a child of the, uh, the Great Depression and just partly choosing to live the life the way he did which you know they would just scavenge and scrounge for things. Mm. You know. Yeah so how did you meet Merle initially? How did I meet him initially? Um um, so it was just a phone call, really. Uh, the long story goes, I was going down the road, uh, the big highway here between uh, Milwaukee and Wisconsin is I-94. And I was driving down there, I think it was October of 2008. And I had my young daughter in the back seat. She was squawking about something, probably dropped her pacifier. I was trying to <laughs> solve her problem, not get in an auto accident, but I wasn't paying attention to my speed. And the Racine County Sheriff was happy to pull me over over and let me know I was going over the speed limit. Um, I tried to explain to him I was late. I was going to go to Chicago. And um, while he was writing my ticket, I happened to be right in front of the giant sign that you see in the beginning of the film and the farmhouse is there. And I would passed it a whole bunch of times since moving to Wisconsin and always wondered what it was. But I was sitting there having to wait longer than normal and really wondering like, who is living out there and what's going on out there? And I do need a project to work on. So I'll add it to my list. I added it to my list, got back on the road. And oh, you'll like this, Daniel. I was actually going to meet... Um, um, John Jones for <laughs> uh, going there. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. Is so oh, Ron, you, you just froze for a moment. So oh yeah, you, you froze for a say, but you, you were going to meet John Jost for food of some kind. Yeah, I, I knew he was in Chicago and I hadn't seen him in a while. And so I drove down there and my wife was actually also at work doing some work in Chicago or something for her job. And so I was picking her up and we were getting breakfast with John. That's the reason I was rushing down there was to get her and go meet John. And uh, I forgot all about this until I got home one day and I was like looking through my notes and I was like, oh yeah, I should go check out about what that's about. And I had a day off from work or something. So I drove down to the farm. No one was around. I tucked a note in the door and said, I'm interested in lossonomy. Call me. And I left my number. And then I forgot about that. And like two weeks later, I get this call in the evening. And this guy was like, so you want to know about lossonomy? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I forgot about that. Um, sure. What, what's lossonomy? And he's like, I don't know. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. He's like, I just rent this little property at the front of the farm. If you want to know about lossonomy, you need to contact this other guy, Merle. So I contact Merle. It's probably November at this point. And I don't I leave a message on his answering machine saying, hey, I've been told you're the guy to talk to about Lasonomy. This is my name. Please give me a call back. No, you know, that I want, was interested in a documentary or anything like that. <clears throat> and then I never heard back until like April or May of 2009, almost like six months later. Merle picks up or Merle calls me and I'm he's like, so you want to know about Lasonomy? <laughs> and I'm like, oh yeah, I do. I think still. And he's like, well, I'm Merle and blah, blah, blah. And he kind of told me he was, you know, the guy to talk to. So I called up my producer friend and good friend, Terry, who's, you know, helped me make this film and we drove down there and we didn't have a camera on us or anything we just were going to interview him talk to him he inter brought us into that same apartment here you see in the film over and over he sat us down in the corner by this bookcase betty 
is sitting there at the table like she always is in the film. She's just knitting away. Merle sits down with a chair and sat there for four hours talking our ear off about this thing called Lawsonomy and who Alfred Lawson was and how the whole history of America that we've been taught is wrong and there's this whole other history. It just went on. You don't want to talk about tangents. He had tangents. He'd pull mm -hmm. books off the shelf and thumb through it and show us something about how, you know, it'd be something like, did you know that the Russians helped Lincoln win the Civil War? If it weren't for the Russians and like he, this whole thing about the Russian Navy coming to New York and like, we're like, oh my God, okay, this guy's a, this guy's a kind of a, a character. And mm -hmm. we decided at that point we were going to go ahead and make the film. And so that probably a couple months later, we were getting ready to go to Oshkosh for the first filming at the air show we did with mm -hmm. him and Betty. Um, and it was just from that point on, it was just trying to get as much information out of Merle as we could and try to bring all these pieces together in some way that people would watch it and have some idea of what's going on in Lawsonomy, Alfred Lawson's life, and Merle's okay, what, what kind of a crew were you shooting with? Um, Ragtag? <laughs> That's the way to describe <laughs> so, it. So, so, say, so, yeah, like somebody on sound, somebody on video, somebody on. Uh... Well, I wish we had somebody on sound more. Uh, that's that might be a big problem. Uh, no, it was usually, like I said, it was myself and my producer, uh, Terry Cadell, who was also a camera guy. We would trade off the camera back and forth. Um, our other friend, Susan Kearns, was another producer on the film, and um, we let her hold the camera once or twice. She wouldn't take it. We kept pushing it on her, but she wouldn't. <laughs> She's like, you guys shoot. Um, so, you know, now she can blame us for all the bad shots. But then I got, like, other friends in there. Uh, you know, a great guy, Jimmy Michaels, came in and shot some extra camera for us a couple days. Some really crucial interview stuff with us. Um, and another guy in there Dan Kelly and you know it was just whoever we could grab to, you know from our small circle of filmmaker friends here in Milwaukee um, mm -hmm. I mean the list of names that helped out is pretty long it's you know there in the film and uh, but yeah it was just whoever needed to be there at the time and could be there at the time but for the most part it was Terry Susan myself and then outside of shooting it we had our editor Jessamy who was through it so between the four of us that was the main crew just Susan Terry Jessamy and I mm -hmm. so were, were you working on other other projects at the same time or was it this year for eight years uh, this was your project i wish that could have been my project i could have done it in four <laughs> uh when no one's paying you to make a movie you gotta, you gotta work other jobs so i was a instructor and the co-director of a documentary center at the university of wisconsin milwaukee when we started this week uh, I'd say about halfway through that, I left the university to go freelance. I was actually shooting a short documentary about a summer camp for children who have lost family members in the wars, uh, the Iraq war and Afghanistan war. Um, so I did that in between this. I actually finished up a documentary with students at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, while I was, yeah, we were shooting this. So yeah, we finished that up. Uh, that was another feature about an inner city track team. It was transitioning from one of their coaches passing where the founder passing away to a new bunch of coaches and then i went on to do freelance work so i did some commercial work and a lot of stuff for nonprofits, like the john michael kohler arts center here in wisconsin and then i started editing for um a public television show here in wisconsin called wisconsin foodie and that's been my main gig since then is just producing and editing that show so you did you you like look at food most like most of your day is is like looking at food yes uh food uh before it's food and then you know once it's processed into food so it's like literally how the sausage get gets made oh yeah i've got lots of footage of sausage going <laughs> are you serious what? i don't know why you're so excited by this right <laughs> Well, no, because you know it's 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 uh, it's an aphorism, right? You say you know about about seeing how the sausage gets made. No, but he nope. actually sees how it. Yeah, and, and every season they won't let me put grinder by Judas Priest to it, but I try. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, no, that's what I do. I, I watch I watch the food porns or I make the food porns. Oh, okay, good. yeah. Uh, so, so do the. You said it, not me. I was thinking like, is it food porn? Yeah, okay. So, so is the food like I know people probably ask you all of this all the time but is the food really like that in real life you know don't, like is the fantasy real in our show it is because we shoot it like a documentary um <laughs> and we don't do like you know it's not commercial shoots where we're uh, substituting mm. lard for ice cream and just you know like so it doesn't melt under the lights or whatever um right no we, it looks like that you know the trick is just shoot everything in slow-mo and with fire people like slow motion and fire <laughs> <laughs> Or I'll just beavis and butts. That's, that's <laughs> really what it comes down to. You know? Yeah, fire, fire's cool. Oh, right, right. Or fire, fire, fire. Fire, fire, fire's cool. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going 
how they go. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so that that's what I was doing. Other hustles, you know, besides that, trying to you know be a new father to two kids and you know mm-hmm. have a happy family and juggle you know other dramas, the economy falling apart, you know, <laughs> things like that. Oh, which time? Well, the first time. <laughs> Which world will tell you was 1920, and then 1929 right. <laughs> again, and then 2009. Wait, what happened in 1920? Was that like the Florida rental thing? 1920 was, a, um, I believe, a year of a drought in a farm. There was something to do with the farms, I think. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then, um, then the, we had the big one. Yeah. Right, and then there was the 87 one. Ah, who remembers that? One? Yeah, that was like, that was the week one. Yeah. Yeah, it's a uh, man. So this is uh, you think there are going to be any good economics cults coming out of this? <laughs> I heard about this Occupy Wall Street thing. I, I, <laughs> sounds like a cult. Yeah, I I don't uh, nobody nobody's still showing up. There's no Merle. There's like we asked him about Occupy Wall Street a couple times, and I probably have to dig out the transcripts to remember exactly what he said. But you know, it was basically like old man. And, you know, they don't know. They think they know, but they don't know. We do. And, you know, we are, like, there was never a generation like ours before, and there'll never be one afterwards. That, you know, we've got. Oh, yeah. When you press the greatest generation guys on that great greatest generation shit, they are so, like, my grandfather used to be, like, so into that. It was like, yeah, Walter Cronkite called us the greatest generation for a re- It was like, that was, like, his thing. Like, that's what happened when, like, the hip gives out, and you're, like, watching TV. TV all day and, and it, it's just sort of like yeah but I'm part of the greatest generation you know like, well the other thing was Merle would turn against his own generation and say that most of them once the economy recovered sold out mm, and mm. it was him and a, you know a small bunch of others that like didn't buy into that whole get back from the war get yourself a job and get to work thing you know mm. he he was more of the the system is inherently corrupt not just good enough that the economy has to rebound we have to like dismantle the whole thing thing and put in Lawson's time. Mm. Remember when all the hippies became Gordon Gecko? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. The, what's his face? Not Abby Hoffman, the other guy. Uh, the the, the pocket, all the diet pills. Uh, Jerry Rubin. He like I went from that. the yuppie in the yeah, yeah, like the the second in command in the the Youth International Party. Okay. He like went full yuppie in the eighties. Uh, God, I mean, a, a lot of the time I spent at Occupy Wall Street was there was this guy who kind of took up residence in this chair next to the chair where I'd kind of taken up residence um but his like his big thing was that he'd thrown a pie at uh oh shit William F. Buckley's brother who was running for some kind of office like in the mid-1980s he threw a pie at this guy on national television and he smoked weed in front of Ed Koch when Ed Koch was the mayor of New York right, this, that, is, this is my new favorite person yeah yeah yeah, and so, but like all he did all day was he'd, he'd registered this website to talk about how he'd thrown this pie this one time. <laughs> <laughs> and he would just like straight and he was like he he knew Abby Hoffman and all those guys but like he'd never gotten quite to that level he just he had this one pie incident <laughs> where was I going with this I, I just keep saying pie oh wait so did like oh, he, he, he wasn't a yuppie he he didn't no no he he didn't go yuppie but okay. um God, there was some kind of point I was made I can't remember I just kept saying but now I'm like hungry <laughs> <laughs> so you know but it's interesting talking about Occupy Wall Street because because early on in the film, I, I I think it's one of the one of the things that Lawson said, and he actually talks about the one percent. Yeah, that's what really you know when we first sat down with Merlin, he was expounding all these theories, just he's throwing these things about direct credits, which to this day I still fully don't understand all the ideas of the direct credits. Because <laughs> again, I was part of maybe Lawson's genius was don't get into the details because that's where the devil is. Well, that that was Emerson, right? Like yeah. Ralph Waldo Emerson. The reason why everybody remembers him and not the other guys of that time period is because he never specifies what the hell he's talking about. He uses like all these <laughs> visual metaphors and then doesn't tell you what they're a metaphor for outside of like a word. Yeah. I mean, so Lawson's did say though, and I, you know, I have still a copy of this early uh, magazine he put out called The Devil. It was a predecessor to most of his other publication. And it was all about how finance is evil. Mm-hmm. It's 
And in there, it clearly says it's the matter of the 1% working against the 99%. And we were like, well, wait, you know, like, this is like 1908, 1914, somewhere in there. No, like, and right then it was really when Occupy Wall Street was blowing up and we we're hearing that we're thinking like, oh, okay, this is kind of timely with what's going on. Um, and I guess it's sad that it is timely, but I think it's a problem we'll keep having for a while with capitalism that, you know, right. the 1% is looking after themselves. And, and yet at the same time, Lawson was all always this weird conundrum because you felt like he easily probably could have slid into being comfortable and happy as part of the one percent if his fortune had gone a different way with the airliner mm. you know i mean it's not coincidental that after he can't get money to keep making these airplanes he finds a new enemy and the financiers and suddenly transforms himself once again into a man of the people you know it's, right he could have been like norman lear and invented the a track and this would have been like a very different different movie yeah I, it's just you know the, the, i think it's not even just a different movie it's just lawson's life i mean he moves from one thing to the other there's no success in baseball or you know that, but then it falls apart and there's you know i mean there's things the movie we left out but you know he goes into airlines and he works in that he goes into publications he, then he also dipped in for a while into the double decker bus industry which you know something we didn't cover in the film but wow he, yeah he like he actually i've got these beautiful photos of the lawson double decker bus i think it was in Cleveland he tested it out and you know he was constantly jumping on to whatever opportunity he thought was coming way next it was airlines and then it was being a man of the people and fighting the uh you know poverty that was running rampant across the land but when that disappeared you got to make something up so he goes for religion yeah you know, like major league baseball back then did not pay anywhere anything even close to what it pays now no but you know what it was I think it was a, it was there was a lot of it there was a grift and a scam these guys I mean he was one of many people back in that day who was putting together these ragtag little leagues of teams and getting people to come pay money uh, to see them. I mean, there's a whole other fascinating story. And this is why I talk, you know, talk about rabbit holes. This is a problem with he had with our film is like that, you know, I mean, we fought for a while to even whether or not we're going to add baseball in and baseball out just because there was a lot of good visuals from that era. So that made it hard to show it. And, you know, it was just a little blip of all these other things we had to try to explain. But Lawson actually had a brother named George Lawson. So there's Alfred and George. And George was like always chasing after after Lawson's little bit of fame trying to get his own. And there's a really good book that was put out by a guy named Jerry Coots, uh, who helped with our film. He gave us some like advice and things like that. And his book was really helpful. But George and was almost crazier than his brother Alfred. I mean, he was a like vaudeville troop manager. He was, I think, a psychic at one point in time that he tried to be. He then went on to try to form his own baseball leagues, but he was pushing for integrating the races in the baseball leagues in the late 1800s wow. that was like that was his that was actually like his twist it was like oh what makes my league different than everybody else's it'll be integrated mm. well this pisses off the kkk so then he actually becomes like a crusader against the kkk and that's what his brother decides to take on as the next role in his life i mean like yeah I, i'm telling you there's a part of me that wants like you know i i just really want to make a netflix mini series about these two crazy brothers trying to barnstorm across america with whatever scheme they can come up with next i was yeah. gonna say it seemed I, like I, it could get expanded really yeah. easily like it seems structured like like almost like in a i don't think anybody else calls him this but like an accordion movie yeah like like almost a backdoor pilot where there's like a lot of little things where it's like oh this could be expanded like a lot mm -hmm. along the way but uh, yeah, I mean, like Lawson was just this guy that kept trying to find, I guess, fame, power, fortune, you know? Who would you have play Lawson? <laughs> I think Mark Metcalf would be a little annoyed if we didn't cast him again, because that was the actor that we got mm. to play the voice of Alfred Lawson. <laughs> and I think he relished it. He, he certainly gave, you know, his all to those performances. And I, you know, I can't think of enough for, for doing that for us, but I'd probably have to just say I'd have to pick him. Mm. I like him, you know? Mm. Um, so he just would yell at you if you weren't wearing your direct credits badge on your, uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> fraternity sweater or sorry i'd be the other way around i guess yeah okay. so, oh sorry sorry go ahead go ahead no i was gonna say what what else <laughs> Okay, there was one little thing that you mentioned earlier that's been like gnawing at my brain. Uh, the thing that he said about um, Lincoln and the Russians. Oh, this is Merle. <laughs> Any truth to it? Uh, 
I'll leave you guys to figure that one out. Maybe for a future right. podcast. He had some book he would always pull down. It was like a link. I think it was just Lincoln and the Russians or something like that. I looked into it briefly, maybe like a Wikipedia look or something like that. It, it sounded like there was some variant of the truth in there, you know, that like mm. Lincoln did ask Russia to help with some issue at a port or something like that, or to blockade like maybe English ships from delivering goods to the South or something like that. I, I don't mm. know. But, okay. you know, it's one of these things where I, I get fascinated by the forgotten parts of history or the weird things that you didn't learn in the kind of canonical idea of American history. So, but then again, I also don't want to go full on conspiracy theorist and think that that right, right. Little piece of information I stumbled upon yeah. was the key that unlinks or links everything together and makes it all make sense. And you know. So would you put it in the category, Lasonomy, in the category of religion? Because I know you, you mentioned it briefly and I know there was... Um, uh, there was at least one person who was, who was talking about it in those terms. Well, I mean, yeah, I guess, you know, Lawson himself termed it a religion and there's, you know, an argument whether or not he really wanted to do that. We kind of mentioned that in the film that like people in the group weren't, you know, wanted something as a, a religion, like that they, a belief they were, a system they were following. And he was asking them all these things about, you know, or telling them all these things about how they should be living their life, what they should be believing, to things even about creation, about how the world came into existence things that you would find, I guess, in a lot of religious text. Right. Um, well, that's kind of it, it come in full circle, right? Because like the, the root of most like self-help style books in the U.S., um, I, I got the, the book over here somewhere. It's uh, it's called Character is Capital, but it's like mostly just read, or at least the, the bits I've read of like self-help books, um, pre-Dianetics, like pre-Great Depression, it all kind of reads like Neoplatonism but they're like replacing God with money or like propriety or some other random word towards a social norm. So it, it'll read kind of like Plotinus or something like, if you keep the good breeding in your hygiene, you will approach the bunny or so the, not, not like that quite that still did but you know because they had a lot of you know if you're writing a book back then you went to some kind of finishing school but like um no i mean there's there's i mean there's, you know you've started most it almost seemed like counterfeit religious writing basically it, it it's like this kind of weird copy pasta yeah. of theology well i think that's what happened is like he i mean if you look at his last book called lasonian religion and if you want to look at him i still have shelves of them <laughs> oh yeah you were sending me all those great pictures when you were what was it like right after you finished you say you were sending me all those pictures of like I, there's this barn of books i don't know yeah. what to do with these things. oh yeah yeah I, well a lot of the lost anatomy ones that merle had collected i still have the ones that weren't lost anatomy i they <laughs> They, they're gone. Oh yeah, um, I mean, it looked like I mean, they had to be like two, three thousand books. Oh, it was it was a ridiculous amount, and that was you know the stuff we pulled out of the like you know his apartment was just a small portion of what he had access to at one point. Um, I mean, there were so many books that just rotted out in those barns because those barns are all gone now, and, and mm -hmm. they first all yeah. fell apart, and rotted, and then the land got decimated and replaced by a Foxconn plant. Now, so the old Lawsonomy farm is now being built into a Foxconn, like plasma TV or something like that. Um, oh, man. But uh, yeah, those, the Lawsonomy or Lawsonian religion book, in a way, is just a lot of text copied from previous books he had written mm. with maybe minor changes to include the idea of like a spiritual or the spirit or, you know, and the idea of religion. But a lot of his books, I mean, he published a ton and ton of different books. A lot of them are very much copy pasted. Like you'll find a chapter in one book that tells you about health and that same chapter will be in another book about it but it's just like the same thing health it's just in a different order different place you know um like he's got one on you know man life the main book that tells you how to live your life is just that it's like these breakdowns of you know this is what you do like to stay healthy by drinking this much water or taking a cold shower every day or eating a raw onion um you know and that same thing will be in the gardening book about why you should eat a raw onion or something like that so what about merlin betty i mean there was a real there relationship is a really important part of the film in some ways it felt almost like 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 the core or that's that's what was pulling it all together right we learned about loss and we learned about lawsonism but we really got to see merle and betty and they just seemed i know they were high school sweethearts and he left and all this stuff but they seemed to be in love even if like, i wasn't i didn't quite it's like a love triangle right between like <laughs> the, the woman changes but it's always between him
Adam Lawton and, and uh, I guess Roy yeah, it's like Margie right and too. Betty are interchangeable as his, you know, his wife, and then his high school sweetheart he's rekindled with can swap out. You know, after getting know, to know Merle and everything all this time, I don't doubt that he had a level of love for Betty. I don't think that it matched her level of love for him. I mean, she was truly the one that would tolerate him. You know, like mm. he did not like being in Florida. He did not like being away from his stuff, his artifacts. Yeah. Um, he liked being with her. He liked caring for her. They were very sweet together. Whereas with Margie, his first wife that he met through the organization, there was almost a like an admiration. I wouldn't even call it a love. It was just an admiration for like how dyed in the wool dedicated she was. That he almost, you know, was aspiring to be as equally mm. dedicated as she was, you know. Um, I mean, there's no doubt he was, but that was where it was equal. They were both, they were both equally in love with Lawson, you know, love. So later Betty on. is Betty, then Lawson is Veronica. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, but I think that we, our biggest regret was that we didn't get to spend more time with Betty because she was quite a character. She's obviously our human, like, or, you know, I mean, or like our, our viewers inroad into the world of Los Anami and the world of love. Like, we I can, was going to say, she's watching the movie kind of like how I was watching the movie. Like, I can't figure out why this guy's doing this stuff. Yeah. I'm, but I'm compelled, but I'm very confused. And she has this, like, great expression that she uses a lot in the movie of just like yeah like I'm not sure why he's doing any of this stuff but I can't stop looking at it <laughs> no I we sympathize with her and I think we can see the world through her eyes uh you know it, like, like I said he he did not understand why we were filming that he's like <laughs> she doesn't know anything about lost on me you don't need to talk to her we'd have to like sneak moments with her um you know uh, you know, the whole interview we did with her out at the, the trailer was like done because Merle was back at the booth. Otherwise, you know, we would never have got to ask the questions we did out there. Um, it was just sad that, you know, uh, she was not able to be in the film more. Yeah. yeah. I, and when it, when I saw it. You're supposed to say spoiler alert, Ron. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, we'll cut that out. Oh, right, right. This movie was only meant, meant, meant um, came out three years ago, right? So yeah. usually what we do, we spoil movies all the time. I, um, I, I'm well, I, I spoil one specific movie every episode of this podcast. <laughs> and and I put uh, white noise over it. <laughs> What movie is it? Uh, so, so you ever seen that movie where the the guy like uh, he, he like keeps saying Rosebud over and over again for some reason? He's got like a lot of crap in his garage. And there he did it again, and there comes the white noise. So. <laughs> I don't know why. I don't never know heard why. of this film. You, you never heard of the movie? Rosebud is the name of the movie. Rose, I think it was called Rosebud or Rosebud uh, colon. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was oh like a, it was a straight to video sequel to Jack Frost, the the one about the the snowman. I've always wanted to watch that movie just because I heard Henry Rollins. Was... Uh, well, I can't remember if that's the one where the snowman goes crazy and kills everybody, or the snowman is like the ghost of the person's dead stepfather. You're right. I think they're the same. In both counts. It's the same it's title. Same title. Okay. Yeah, it's one of those. There's a couple of those I've seen on lists of like movies parents accidentally showed their kids and they were showing them to. <laughs> other one i don't remember what else is on that list but you know debbie does daycare I don't know. debbie does daycare. <laughs> <laughs> oh man but, uh... Uh, but wasn't, uh, what, what, yeah, yeah. What I was gonna say is we don't we don't really think of this uh, normally as a, it, they're not film reviews where it's it's we're talking about films. So so they usually they're they're older. Well, uh, like they they've been ten years older um, so far. So like you know people have seen this or if they haven't, um, well hopefully this will get them to watch it or they can just stop listening before the spoilers. And and we even have on the description of every uh, uh, um, uh, on every episode that says you know this may contain spoilers or not. Even May. It's this will contain spoilers, but uh, but they're for also Citizen older Kane. Movies. But all, only spoilers for Citizen Kane. Yeah, that's yeah, that's the only movie. That's our spoiled. promise to the audience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, I, I'm not sure exactly which part I'm gonna white noise. I don't know why I have this. I really don't want to spoil Citizen Kane. Um, and. <laughs> That's the one movie. So uh, um, I'll, 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 I'll cut out the little bit in which I spoiled this movie. That's fine. I, you know what? You can spoil it all you want. Uh, people have their three years if they haven't got on it now. <laughs> you know? Been out there. <laughs> I just, if they want to go watch it, I'm happy. Not any other viewers. 
It's yeah. weird when you put a movie. It's weird when you put a movie out there and like three years later, it's new to someone. That's kind of interesting because you're like, oh, that that was you know like I'm glad someone's watching it. I almost forgot that there'd be a new viewer. You know, like you get a rush right at the beginning of everybody like we've been waiting to see this movie. We found you know we finally see it, and then it's like, oh, okay, the excitement's done, and they're on to the next you know the next new movie, the next new movie, and so after a while right. you're like, oh yeah, I forgot that anybody would go back and watch something. Look, suddenly you've got two new viewers. So. Yeah, there you and go. One, yeah, you know, yeah. All um yeah so i didn't even realize this had come out yet because you were working on this the last time yeah the only here. time we we ever we ever met in person yeah when i was coming through uh wisconsin yeah and I was... and i didn't realize until like a week or two ago i think i sent you a message i was like because uh the the original working title wasn't man life right it was uh last we of the lawsonists last of the lawsonomists and so lawsonomists okay so the title was that and then the, the reason lawsonomists was picked was because there was another writer and historian who used the term and there was another little piece we saw about the group that used the term and I think those were some of the first instances we had of a name for the, the group the members of this group so we, we just that was what rolled off the tongue and was written on the page for all our notes and um, it stuck and then halfway through we were like you know the actual term they use is Lawsonian once in a while you'll hear them say Lawsonian but it's very rare it's all um, it, it's always Lawsonian hmm. and so Merle was like you know kind of like yeah you should probably change it to Lawsonian so we did and and then we went through all these other variations. Merle was not really big on us using his name in the title of the film. And not that we would have like mm. felt like we could have not got the film out with his name, but we, we just weren't sure about a film called Merle. And then we'd have to use Last of the Lawsonomists or Lawsonians. Mm. So by the time we had to just pull the trigger and release the film, it became, we had started focusing on the, the title Man Life. Um, that's a play on like a man's life and the fact that that's Lawson's main how to live your life book. And we felt Merle lived his life as best he could, like Lawson. Put it out at the Chicago Underground Film Festival with the name of uh, of uh, Last of Lawsonians after, you know, Man Life, Last of Lawsonians. And at the same time, we were talking with few members of this organization that still are out there, that still exists. Um, they'd, we'd actually, I had had conversations with them once or twice throughout the production of the film. Uh, and they weren't really pleased with the fact that we were saying Merle was the last of them because there were others. The board that you hear about Merle railing against in the film, you know, these are some of the members of this board, a few of them. Some of them are descendants. I think at that point. It's a very small group. They weren't getting together. We tried to get them in to be part of the film. They just didn't want to meet us on any sort of terms other than being really like, you know, making almost like a scripted statement, you know. Um, and we're like, no, we want we want to ask questions and, you know, be like a real documentary about it, not just, you know, a propaganda piece or anything for you guys or just a message or soapbox for you. Uh, but they wouldn't agree to it. And so we ended up kind of just coming to a mutual agreement with the organization that, you know, we could use some of the music in the movie because it was sort of under a hymnal book that the group had put out, the, the lyrics you hear and the performances you hear could appear as long as we just didn't make reference to Merle being the last of the group anymore. So we said, okay, well, seems like an easy win for us to do that and a win for them. So I was happy with it. We just did Man Life. But that then we lost you as a viewer, Daniel. So I guess it wasn't the best choice because you lost Oh, yeah, because I, I, I could Well, I finally did see it. And uh, yeah. no, it was, it was good. Uh, yeah, no, it's just when I saw the new title, I, I was thinking about like, I, I was thinking about like if I'd seen the title and I didn't know what the project was already, like I would have assumed assumed it was some kind of Judd Apatow movie. <laughs> like, can you imagine, like, like knocked up, but without the pregnancy or Catherine Heigl, it's just four guys kind of, like, living down rent in, like, a, a, a bad apartment, just man, Judd Apatow's man life. Right. That might sell a little more if I put that on. <laughs> it could also mean calls from other lawyers. That's true. <laughs> so between, uh, between Seth Rogen, Paul Rudd, and Steve Carell, who would play Merle, and who would play Play <laughs> I don't know why I go with Steve Carell for, for Merle. I think he's got the most range. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. So, cool. So you got another uh, film you're working on now, or just the, uh, the food? Yeah, I'm working on a I'm working on a fishing documentary. Um, it's uh, about the uh, Gulf Coast of Florida area where uh, fishermen for years have been fishing for a specific type of fish called mullet. And that economy and the culture and the fishermen themselves is dying off for various reasons. So a buddy of mine started filming this many years back and. 
and we're kind of reinvigorated and, and teamed up now to go down there and finish this thing off. And then all of a sudden COVID hits, so I don't know what we're doing right now with that. Um, otherwise, uh, trying to work on a, you know, a actual fictional film for a first time or maybe an episodic series with a buddy of mine named West Tank, who Daniel, you stayed with. Oh, yep, yep. Yep. So he and I have been MC writing. West Tank. Yes. So anyways, um, that's about it. You know, other than that. So how, how far along is the movie? Oh, it's, we're, we got to go through a ton of footage that was shot and then we have a whole bunch of new shooting to do. So it's, you know, hopefully it won't take eight years, but right. do well, what well, you think. Well, well, yeah, well, uh, when, whenever it comes out, we'll have to have you back on the show. All right, man. It's been great. Yeah. All right, cool. All right. Have a great night. Oh, so this was uh, an excellent episode uh, of Anomaly, Anomaly Questionable Movies uh, with um, with Ryan Sar- Sarnow. Am I pronouncing your name right? Ryan Sarnow. Sarnowski. Sarnowski. Okay. Yep. Sorry, I get tripped up. I get tripped up on the name of our show, so. <laughs> but uh this has been ron this has been dan and uh yeah, this ryan. Been, yeah. <laughs> all right and this has been an right. you're stepping on my line. <laughs> hey everybody this is ron uh and that was our episode with ryan sarnowski um we're really glad to have him on get a chance to talk to him and about his movie man life uh if you're interested in learning more about the movie and watching it uh visit manlifethemovie.com that's manlife the movie.com. All right. Take care, everyone.